we've been talking about Thanksgiving, and out of the learnings that we've had over the two weeks, we discovered that Thanksgiving is simply three things, confession, praise, and offering. When men come to God in confession, confession here is basically acknowledgement. When we come to profess, to thank him for what he's done for us, and we come to praise him, and we come to offer an offering of appreciation and gratitude, that's what we believe Thanksgiving is all about. And I want to come to the point where I want to let you know the principle of Thanksgiving is well established when we understand the command that God gave Israel to observe after getting into the land that he was giving him. Last Sunday, I attempted to share with you what Jesus did for us on the cross when he died. And we realized that Jesus literally reversed the curse that was upon the land or the ground which God had given to Adam. And here was Israel going to a land which God was giving to him to signify the provisions of God, to signify the providence of God that he was going to give to his people. And so God gave them a principle. He gave them certain things that he, he told them, when you enter the land which I'm giving to you, a land that is compared to the land that God has given to us or the land that we seek to receive when we get to the kingdom of God, he said, do the following things. And these were the things which acknowledged God as the giver of life and the giver of the things that he had given to them. So I want to bring to you four things that God told Israel to do. I remember I gave you some homework on a scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know how many of you read that or did that homework. I will ask your children. For some of uh, you who have children here, I'll, I'll find out whether you did anything about it. But I gave you some homework. And I told you I will be talking about that. So I want to summarize that in four things that God told Israel to do as a way of thanksgiving. And when we do these four things, believe me, that's the only way we can express our thanksgiving to God and to make him know that we acknowledge him as the giver of all the things that we have. Remember, he had brought Israel out of a land of oppression, a land where they'd been for over, over 400 years, and they'd been under the yoke of the Pharaoh of that land. So God told them the following things to do. And I'll begin with the point number one. He told them to observe all the way. Observe all the way. And when I use the word observe here, I'm, talk, I'm talking about O-B-S-E-V-A, -E, observe. Observe means pay attention to all the way that I've taken you through. Now, Thanksgiving is when we remember what God has done for us and we observe what God has given to us. Thanksgiving is literally when you come to the place where you look back and you see what is it that God has done for me. For Israel, they had been in Egypt for a period of close to 430 years. And all of us know they were under what we call a slavery. They were not just in Egypt to enjoy themselves. They were there under the yoke of the enemy. And God did marvelous things for them. So he was telling Israel, please take stock of where I have brought you from. Stock taking. Those who do business, those who are in companies, those who work out there and you are in a business concern. There is a time in the year when you stop everything and you do what we call a stock taking. You look back at what you have. You look back at your profits. You, you look at what you have at hand. And then you declare the profits which God has given to you. It's done everywhere. I served in a warehouse somewhere. And once in a year, we would close the warehouse and would tell people we are not opening because we are doing stock taking. Now, in the lives of Israel, God told them to take stock of what he has done for them. And he told them, remember the, all, the whole way, the whole way, not one way, or not only where you are, but the whole way. And I find this scripture in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 1 to verse 2, if you can turn there. So thanksgiving is when we observe, we see what God has done from where we were. We are here in the beginning of the year. And over January and February and March, we have God has worked with us. God has been with us. God has protected us. God has healed us. And we are now in the month of December. A year is almost over. We need to look back and observe what is it that God has done for us from the first day when we declared him as Lord in the beginning of the year. So this is what he told Israel very quickly. I'll go over this very fast so that I can be able to save on time. He said, all the commandments which I give or I command thee this day, shall ye observe, and the word observe is there, shall ye observe to do, that ye may, three things. When you do that, three things happen. He say you may live, number two, you may multiply, and number three, you may go into the land and possess it. He was giving them a land where they would live, a land where they would multiply, and a land where they would possess that land. 
I said in the first service, this is basically a land where God would make provisions for them, where God will make, sustain them, and where God will settle them in that land. So he said, if you do these things, you will live. And believe me, church, when we do these things, God extends our life. Number two, God multiplies us. And number three, God gives us that which is committed to us to possess it and own it. Remember Adam, he told him, till the land and keep it. All right? So he went further and he said in verse, in verse two, he said, and thou shalt remember. Told Israel, remember all the way. And if I were you in my Bible, I would underline the word all the way. The other Bible says the whole way. And remember all the way which the Lord thy God has led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. They were not to remember where they are. They were to remember where they have come from. For, he mentions here 40 years in the wilderness. Meaning Israel was to go back to the position where they were in Egypt. And remember that we were here in slavery. Then they would begin remembering the whole way. How God took them through the Red Sea. How God walked with them in the wilderness. When they had no food, he gave them food. When they had no water, he gave them water. When there were scorpions in the wilderness, he took care of them. When there was snakes to bite them, the Lord was with them. When there was, there was the cold of the night, the Lord gave them a covering. The heat of the day, the Lord provided a cloud over them. And he kept them in the way until he brought them to the place where they were now to take the land, live in the land, and possess the land. So he told them, remember the 40 years in the wilderness. And then he went further to explain why he took them in those 40 years in the wilderness. Something which makes me believe that whenever I go through trouble in this life, it has a purpose. He said to humble you, to prove you, and to know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. So remember, whenever you're going through any circumstance in your life, God is simply humbling you. Sometimes you'll have no money in your pockets. Sometimes you will have issues in your life which you didn't even expect. God is not allowing you to go through that for any purpose, but to bring you to the place where you can acknowledge him. Because you will never be in that place forever. There are moments when God will bring you from the downs where you are and take you to the ups where you will be. And all these things happen that you may be able to, he may be able to test you to see whether you will keep his commandments or not. In verse 3, if you go to verse 3, and I need not to go too much into verse 3. He says, and he humbled thee and he suffered thee to hunger. And he fed you with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did thy father know it, that he might make thee know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's what God does. So one of the things that Thanksgiving does is for you to go back to where you are and to trace your journey. What is it that God has done in my life? And I want to pray this wonderful morning that God will remind us of the things that he has done for us. I think of myself when the year began, believe me, I was not in the kind of health I am. Some of us we may not stand on the pulpit and tell you how we are feeling. But when this year began, I was sick, believe me. I was going through a condition which nobody apart from a few people understood. But I'm here to tell the Lord in 2023, December, I am healed. And indeed, the Lord has healed me. I'm better than what I was when the year began. Maybe there were moments in your life when you didn't even know how food would come on your table. As we remember where we've come from, we have every reason to give thanks to God. So the first thing that God told Israel was to observe the whole way. Now the second thing, which is akin to the first one, was to have a remembering spirit. Number two is to have a remembering spirit. I'm moving fast. A remembering spirit is almost the same like the one which we have seen in number one. But number one was observe the whole way. You can never thank anyone for anything until you see what that man has done for you. When you observe what he's done for you, then you can be able to, you can be able to give thanks to God. But again, we can know, but we forget. So he told Israel, have a remembering spirit. A remembering spirit. Because avoiding a grateful heart normally leads us to what I'm calling here as priding in what we have achieved. You see, people easily forget. We begin to take pride in the things which we have in life because we think it is our efforts and it is by our own means that we have what we have. It is very easy for you to come on this pulpit and receive a prayer for a job. But the moment that job comes and the moment you begin to earn, you begin to earn your money, the devil makes you to forget that you one time came on the pulpit 
to receive anything from this pulpit. So God told Israel, have a remembering spirit. And how do I know that? I find it in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 to verse 18. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11 to verse 18. If you can turn there with me and we read together. Now, he begins by saying, he says, beware. You know the word beware simply means there is a danger. Beware. When you are driving on the road and you see beware, it is telling you, pale kwa kona, be very careful because something can happen in that corner. So he told them, beware that thou forget not the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. The danger, the danger, and I repeat again, the danger is when we forget what God has done for us. Ask your neighbor, what is it that God has done for you? You're helping me to preach. I know he won't tell you what God has done for you, but there is something which God has done for you, which God is say, telling you, do not forget. Do not forget. Then in verse 12, he said, lest when you have eaten and you are full, the day when you had no food, you remembered God. But the moment you eat and you are full, you know? Some of us, we remember, we, we, we couldn't even tell whether we are going to have breakfast the following day or not. When I was in primary school, living here in Jerusalem, eight of us in one house, my mama, my mama was walking on the street, my dad didn't have a job. We would wake up in the morning, you simply go to the tap, get some water, gargle in your mouth, throw it, and you disappear to school. We never could even ask, where is our breakfast? But today, you look at our children, the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is, Daddy, where is my sausage? I was telling the first church, I never had an opportunity to even eat a sausage until I go to Form 4. And the first man who gave me a sausage was my, 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 my brother-in-law, who had just married my sister. Took me to Jivanji Gardens. You know Jivanji? There was only one shop that was selling fish and chips there. And that sausage, when I ate that sausage, it was a story for the whole year. Telling my friends, and I've, I've eaten something that is long like this, very nice. Now today when you have eaten and you are full, some of us today, you go to our fridges, you find there is a lot of food there. On our tables, we're even throwing away bread. Eh? Those who lived in the 60s and the 70s, from Oshago, how many of you used to eat bread? For some of us, bread was only once in a year. And it only came when my dad was coming for Christmas. And when we moved to Nairobi, bread came once in a month. We, we never knew butter, we never knew blue band, it was not there. Now, God was telling Israel, when you get to the land which I'm taking you, you will find things in that land. And when you have eaten, and you are what? Full. Ask your friend, what is it that you have eaten? You've eaten and you are full. Eh? The Bible says, do not forget the Lord your God. Because that's the danger. That is the danger. The danger is when you have now received it, when you've received that job. For those of you who married this year, when you receive that husband and that wife, you now forget to come for Kesha. And yet every Kesha you're asking, Pastor, pray for me. If the Lord can just... Then the Lord, he overcanias you. What normally happens towards the end of the year? Those of us who are looking for jobs and we were agonizing for you and praying for you. Some of you who are looking for promotion and you came and we prayed for you and God gave you a promotion. You are looking for a baby. You are looking for a spouse and you are given. What happens after you've been given? God warned them, he says, when you have eaten. Then he says, and you have built godly homes, godly houses. Believe me, some of us, we never even imagined we could live in the homes that we are living in today. I remember we, we were living in a grass-touched house, a small little thing in the village. And then we left the village, we came to the city of Nairobi. And as we were going through the motions of school, we could not even imagine that you can sit in a house that has more than one or two bedrooms. I said in the first service, and I was confessing the truth, this video, my family is following it, and they can agree with me it's the truth. I never slept on a bed until I got married. I was sleeping on tables. In the sitting room, we put the table together in the chairs, and I sleep on it. The first time I slept on a bed, a proper bed, not in college or anywhere else, was when I got married. And that was two weeks later, because the, the, the day I was getting married, I didn't even have a bed. I didn't even have a cup. I borrowed two cups. I borrowed two glasses. Someone gave me a small cooker, one burner. Somebody gave me his gas cylinder. My mother gave me a cup. He gave me a, 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 
a, a, a small, a, a small, a small sophoria, which I borrowed for us to begin with our meals because I didn't have anything. Now the Bible says when you have now built goodly homes, we didn't have the luxury of moving from, a, from room to room. Today, my children are grown up, they are gone. I have two bedrooms, three bedrooms with nobody. I can choose which bed to go and sleep on. Can you imagine? But what do we do when we reach there? Let's move on. I want to finish this. And when your herds and your flocks are multiplied, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, this means money. When you have money in your bank, okay? When God has blessed you and you have a bank account, which a number of us never imagined we could have, you know? It says that gold is multiplied. And all that, what you have has multiplied. Number, um, number 14. Then thine heart will be lifted up. And you will do what? You will forget the Lord your God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Now, this is the danger that many of us get into. The moment the Lord has begun to bless us, we quickly forget. Now, Thanksgiving is when you remember. God had reminded Israel who they were. And that's why when you go to verse 15, he begins to remind them. I'll read up to verse 18 and I'll stop there. He reminds them, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness? This is now observing. Obs observing here. Wherein there were fiery serpents. And he mentions, and scorpions. And there was drought in that, in, that, in, in that wilderness. There was no water. Who brought thee forth uh, water out of the rock of, of flint? Verse 16, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which even your fathers knew not? Can you imagine? And he goes further, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at, at thy later end. To signify to me, whatever troubles I've gone through, the Lord has always been, have been having me in mind at the end. And I want to declare this to you. If this year was a year that you went through struggles, next year will be a year without struggles. As long as you thank God, as long as you remember what he has done for you. If there are, there are issues you pass through and you've been wondering, really, what is it that this year has, done, has meant for me? I want to encourage you by telling you God has simply been humbling you to prove to you at the end that he is God. After all, he's the one who has made you. You are the sheep of his pasture. In verse 17, if he says, and that, that, that thou say, and thou say in your heart, and you say what in your heart? My power and what? My, the might of mine, my hand, has gotten me this wealth. That is the danger of when we forget the Lord. And I've seen people, you know, after you prayed for them, yeah, they come and they tell you, Pastor, you know, I've worked very hard. The reason why you see me like this, I have been working very, very hard. Some even tell you, why you don't even know how much effort I've done concerning this matter. But let me tell you, if it, it was not God who, who was giving it to you, your efforts and your power is nothing. The Bible tells me, you forget and you say, my power. You say, my might. Whatever you own is not your power. Whatever you own is not your might. It is not your brilliance. It is not your expertise, believe me. It is not because you are so smart, smarter than everybody else, that you have the things that you have. Let me finish with verse 18. Verse 18 says, but thou shalt remember, he was telling Israel. Help me, remember what? The Lord thy God, why? For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. God gives you the power to make the wealth that you have. And he does not give you that, that power to make wealth for you to cherish it upon yourself. For you to eat good food, for you to enjoy, for you to go out there and do things, especially during this season. For you to go to Mombasa and swim and have a wonderful time and spend money enjoying and drinking. and drink. It doesn't give you that power to make wealth for that purpose. Yes, you may enjoy, but you must recognize he giveth you that power to get wealth that he may, help me here, he may do what? Establish his covenant which he swore unto thy father as it is today. So that everything we have is for us to use it for establishing the covenant, the kingdom of God. Are you with me? So this year, as you give thanks to God, whatever God has given to you, God is giving to you to enjoy it, but enjoy it to establish the kingdom of God. Point number three, because of my time. Point number three, moving a bit faster here. Point number three, God, gives, God wants you to do thanksgiving, or you do thanksgiving through giving of your first fruits according to the Bible. He told Israel, number three, to give their first fruits. 
fast fruits. I think I've tried, attempted to explain to you what fast fruits are. But let me explain to you here a little bit. Go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 10. We read that portion of scripture first before I explain one or two things on this. First fruits, Leviticus 23 and verse 10. And this is what the Bible says. He says, when you come, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye become or when you come into the land, and always he told them when you come to the land, when you come to the land. They couldn't do it when they were in the wilderness. But when you come to the land, meaning when, when you come to the place of your possession, the place of your inheritance, when you come to the place of your providence, that's what the Bible is talking about here. It says, when you come to the land which I gave to you, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Then he says, then, help me here, you shall do what? You shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. The word used there was the word sheaf. Now, sheaf, please for your understanding, sheaf was basically the first of the fruit, the first of the fruit. I'll explain. If this place where the red carpet is was my garden, and I planted some bananas here, I planted some mangoes here, I planted some maize here, and some beans here, I would be observant to check the moment the first bananas begin to ripen up, or the first beans begin to ripen up, or the first maize begins to ripen up, the command of God was you would go into the garden and you would pick the first banana and place it in a basket. You would go and pick the first bean and place it in the basket. You would go and pick the first mango and place it in the basket. And then you would take it to the father, I mean to the priest of the day and tell the priest of the day, these are the first fruits of my produce in my farm. Last Sunday, how many were here last Sunday? I attempted to explain to you how Jesus reversed the curse on the, guard, the, curse on the ground. You remember? And I told you on the cross of Calvary, he literally reversed all that curse that was there. But there was one thing Jesus did beyond the cross of Calvary. A mysterious thing, which many people don't understand. And we never even preach it. Jesus presented the first sheaf of his resurrection to God the Father before he went to heaven. And I'll explain to you and get this right for those who read the Bible. I've been saying some of the truths in the scripture are hidden so that the devil knows when you get them, you will actually get the whole dose. Now remember, after his resurrection, he was in the garden. Just he has resurrected in the garden. And Mary, one of the women, one of the disciples of Jesus, went in the garden and he saw Jesus resurrected. You remember that? And she went to touch Jesus. How many remember that scripture? And Jesus told the lady, woman, do not touch me because I, I, I am yet to present myself to the Father. You remember that? Now, the woman, the, Jesus avoided being touched because he was a consecrated seed, which, which was needed to be presented to God before he can now come back and lead all the others into the kingdom of God. Now, during that season when the resurrection took place, and listen to this very carefully, there were too many things that were happening behind the scenes, just like I explained here last Sunday. And one of the things which happened was this. Hear, hear, this, hear this proper. The, day, the moment Jesus said, into your hands, I commit my spirit, when he was dying. The moment he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit, the Bible tells me there was an earthquake. And during that earthquake, if you read the book of Matthew, it says, and the graves of those who had died opened. I'm imagining. I'm imagining. Tell your friend I'm imagining. Jesus is at, at where? Uhuru Park. That's the Golgotha, where he's being crucified. The one I showed you here. Assume it's Uhuru Park. And then when he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, there is an earthquake and the graves open. And that's around three o'clock in, in, in the afternoon. And there is darkness. The darkness disappears. Now you are going back to Langata. And you pass through Langata area. And you find all the graves of people who died in Langata open. What will happen to you? Ask your neighbor, what, what would you do? And remember, it's not only Langata. Everywhere where there were people who had been buried, the graves did what? Open. And listen to this. And the dead people who had died that loved God, their bones, their bones that were rotten in the graves, those bones remained lying there for two days. Two days. And then the third day when he was resurrecting, the third day when he was resurrecting, the Bible tells me, and the bodies of those who had died resurrected from those graves. Are you still following me? And they were seen in Jerusalem 
Which means people like, Akina, I mean, people like Akina Moses, sorry, let me not talk about, yeah, Moses, yeah. People like Akina David, actually they resurrected with Jesus from the grave. And they were seen temporarily in Jerusalem. They were not there to stay. They were only seen in Jerusalem walking. I'm imagining Pastor Simon walking. I'm imagining Elder Najoli in, up in, in Embakasi, you find him near the, the mall there. He's walking. How many of you will still not believe in Jesus? And that happened in a span of some minutes. After that, the Bible tells me they disappeared. To simply signify, when he was telling the woman, don't touch me, Jesus had resurrected with all these men, and he was now carrying them with him, who had been bound in the, under, in, in, in the underworld, translating the underworld into the heavens where we are. He picked them. The Bible says he took captivity captive. And he took them to the Father and presented them to God the Father as the first fruits of all of us. Ah, uh, you are the only people who don't understand my sermon here. So that you, when you die, you will be resurrected. Yeah. Believe me, we are waiting for the coming of Jesus. But even before then, before people began going there, he took the first fruits and presented them to God. This is what the Bible is calling here, first fruits in Israel. He was simply telling them, when the Lord has blessed you in the land that you are in, take the first of the fruits and bring them to God to show that you believe in him and you are depending on him. Let God help you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 to verse 5. Deuteronomy 26, 1 to 5. Five more minutes I'll be done. Deuteronomy 26, verse 1 to, verse 1 to 5. For you to understand what I'm talking about. He says in that verse, it shall come, it shall be. Again, he's saying, when thou comes into the land which the Lord your God is giving to thee for an inheritance and possesses it and dwells therein, the place of your dwelling, the place of your provision, the place of your sustenance. The Bible says in verse 2, listen, that thou shall take, help me here, what? Uh, come on, read with me. The first of all the fruit of the earth, the earth, the earth that was cast. He says, thou shalt bring it of your land that the Lord your God has given thee. And you shall put it where? In a basket. And shall go to the place which the Lord your God has chosen to place his name there. This is the scriptures I gave you to read. So you will take a basket, pick a, fruit, a guava, pick a mango, pick a banana, pick whatever, and take it to the priest of the day. Let's continue reading, okay? Then he says, and thou shalt go to the priest, and that shall be in those days, and you will say to him, that is now confession. You will begin confessing, proclaiming. You will begin actually, up, what I would call here, I'm not, this is not confession of sin. You will begin to acknowledge, acknowledge, and you will say, look, I profess this day unto the Lord my God, that I am come to the country which the Lord swore unto my fathers to give to me, or to give to us. Go to verse 4. And the priest shall take the basket out of your hand, and set it down before the altar of God thy father. So the priest will take it, put it on the altar. Let's keep reading. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord, this is now what I'm calling here confession, then praise, and then offering. You will say to the Lord, the God, Assyrian. Assyrian was their father, Abraham. Assyrian was their father, Jacob. Mlema, I will say, Amaragoli. Now you can put your name there. You can put your tribe there. Mimi Amaragoli from Mahanga. I'll say Assyrian, ready to perish, was my father. And he went down to Egypt. So Mlema left Mahanga. He went down, she came down to Nairobi. When we came to Nairobi, we didn't even know we'd become what we are. My father came alone on a bicycle. That's all. But by the grace of God, when he came to Nairobi, he sojourned there with a few. He was with my mother. All right? You, you can give, put your story there. And you'll say, and we became there a nation. Today we are many. We fill the whole of this city. Our brothers here and there and the other have children everywhere. Now that's the confession there. We become a great nation. We have become a great and mighty and populous. This was the confession Israel would make. They would say when, when Jacob came, Assyrian, 
We, we were only but a few. There were about 60, 70 souls. But by the time they were living to this land which God is giving to them, they had become a big and a populous nation. Are you still listening to me? When you came to the city of Nairobi, you had nothing. You are miserable. But now as I look at you, you look smart. You look big. You look blessed. Let's keep on moving. Verse, verse, verse 6, he says, And the Egyptian evil treated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard labor. To tell me, even as though the Lord has blessed you, there is still an enemy fighting you. This year, the devil has tried to afflict you. This year, somebody has tried to hinder your, profit, your, 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 your progress. This year, the devil has, has touched your body. There are certain things that have happened to you during this year that the Egyptian has been trying to hit on your body or on your life. But let's go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, And when we cried unto the Lord our God, the Father, the Lord heard our voice. And can somebody say amen? amen? And he says, And he looked on what? Our affliction and our labor and our oppression. Come on. Verse, verse 8. Verse 8. And the Lord brought us forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness, and with signs and with what? Wonders. That was the profession that they needed to say. To simply tell you, you look back and you see what God has done for you. You look at the mercies, the goodness of the Lord. You look at the blessings of God. And you come to him and you profess, God, you've been so gracious to me. And you say, Father, I thank you. You praise him. And then you say, Lord, and because of this, I'm going to bless you with this. Verse 9 and 10 to Malizia Hapo. And the Lord brought us, he says, and he has brought us into this place. And has given us this land, even the land that flows with milk and honey. When you came to Nairobi, you had nothing, apart from those who were born in Nairobi. But today God has blessed you, you own a house. He, he has blessed you, you have a job. He has blessed you, you have a car. He has blessed you, you have a family. He has blessed you, you are, you are influential. He says here, you've given me a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Now look at verse 10, and he says, and now. Can somebody say, and now? And now what? Help me. Behold, I have brought what? The first fruit of the land which the Lord you have given to me. Then after you've done that, you, will set, you shall set it before the Lord thy God and do what? And worship before the Lord your God. That's how it was done. Year after year. That's how Thanksgiving was done. I hope you're following me. Year after year. Number three and the last one. This is the last one. The last one, number four, is that thanksgiving evoked the blessing of God upon the land. Evoked the blessings of God upon the land. By doing this thing that you have done, or giving thanks like we have seen here, you gave now God an evocation. You are simply provoking God and evoking him. To, pro to, ev to evoke is to cause to do. You know, I can put you in a fix where I'll give you something that will cause you to do something. Then you can love somebody until he gives himself to you. That is evoking. So by thanksgiving, you are evoking God. What Paul speaks and he says, he says, I, do, I desire a gift. I did not desire a gift from you. I desire the fruit that may abound to your account. In thanksgiving, you are actually evoking the blessings of God. You are telling God now, listen, you've been good to me. And now, Father, remember me as I go in the next year. And believe me, God is not a man. God will always remember you when you do it for him. And you will find this in the, book of, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy 26 and verse 15, and I'll end at that. Deuteronomy 26 and verse 15. This is what the Bible says. It says in that verse, after you've given your first fruits, this is what now you will tell God. You will tell God, look down from your holy habitation. This will be the prayer of the priest for you. And the prayer that you will make before God. You will say, look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people, Israel, and the land, and the land, and remember the land, and the land which thou hast given to us, as thou swearest to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. So thanksgiving evokes the blessings of God. The priest will stand and the priest will evoke those blessings upon the land. You know, God had a formula of doing things. He never just did things because he wanted to do things anyhow. 
The kingdom of God is a kingdom of principles and values. It's called kingdom. Kingdom is a king, it's a domain that has its own principles. For Israel here, the only way that God would bless the land of the people of the people was for them to come to him and the priest of the day would evoke his blessings upon the land. For forgiveness of sin, he would, he would sprinkle the blood upon them and their sins would be erased away. In this case here, the priest would stand and the priest would now speak the blessings of God upon the people. And I want to tell you this morning, may the Lord bless you. I don't know if you believe I'm the priest of this house. How many of you believe I am? That's why you came. Can I evoke the blessings of God upon you? Can I do that for you? Now listen, this is what the priest would say. And I want to, make, to read this. When I come here, I'll only make a prayer. The priest would declare the blessings of God upon the people. And he would tell the people this. He would say this. It, this is found in the book of Deuteronomy. But let me read what I have written here for your sake. He would say this. And all these blessings will come upon thee and overtake thee. He says, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, the priest would say, blessed shall thou be in the city. And the people will say what? Amen. Then he'll say, blessed shall thou be in the field. Amen. He will say, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. Amen. He will say, blessed shall be the fruit of your ground. Amen. And the fruit of your cattle. Amen. And the increase of your kind. Amen. And the flocks of your sheep. Blessed shall thou be the, the basket and thy store. Amen. Are you listening to me? The priest would say, blessed shall thou be when you come in and when you go out. Amen. And when you are leaving your, your house, going to the office, the blessings of God are with you. When you are coming back in the evening, you are carrying some stuff from the supermarket. Amen. Now listen, he would say, the Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee in one way and they will flee before you in seven ways. Amen. The priest will say that. He will say, the Lord shall command his blessings upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand upon to do. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord is giving to you. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. He shall say, the Lord shall establish you as a holy people to himself. Uh -huh. He will say, and he, he, he'll continue to say this, the Lord shall make thee pleasures in goods, pleasures in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of your ground. In the land which the Lord swore up to your fathers to give to thee. He will say, the Lord shall open. The seasons shall open unto thee his good treasure. The heaven to give unto thee, to give the land rain in its season. Like he has done for us this year, isn't it? He says, the Lord shall bless all the work of your hand. Thou shalt lend to many and you shall never borrow. The Lord shall make you the head and he shall not make you the tail. You shall only be above and never beneath. Then he'll speak what we call as the priestly blessing. The benediction of the priest. And this is it. He will say, the Lord bless thee. The Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord be gracious to thee. The, the, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. And the Lord give you peace. May that be your blessing today. God bless you. God keep you. I think I'm done with my sermon. Pastor Alan, come. I'll come back to take the Thanksgiving offerings. God bless you.